Just last week, I had the opportunity to interview for an internship with a new company. And as I was getting ready in the morning, I was getting prepared, I double-checked everything, I got into my car, and like any other 21st century individual, I pulled out my smartphone and opened up Google Maps. I feel sorry for those of you who have the unfortunate fate of using Apple Maps, but I promise it still applies. When I opened up the app, I was surprised to see that when I plugged in the destination, I was going to be 15 minutes early. And according to my dad's advice, if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. And if you're late, don't even bother showing up. Not only was I going to be on time, I was going to be early. So I started my trek towards the company to prepare for this interview. About 10 minutes into my journey, I receive a notification. See, there was an accident five miles ahead on the freeway. Now, my arrival time was going to be just over 30 minutes late to the interview. And according to my dad's advice, I shouldn't even bother showing up. I was so frustrated at the fact that my outcome was now different that I couldn't even fathom seeing anything else in this moment or learn from this opportunity. And many of us have experienced this difficulty when it's as simple as driving directions. We often get rerouted. And when our outcome isn't as we originally intended, we have that frustration. We have a feeling of disconnect. And we can see it's because we've been taught this, because the application that's more than likely next to Google Maps is social media in some form. And when you look at Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, what it teaches us, especially as millennials, is that our content is qualified by the amount of likes, retweets, or shares that it receives. It doesn't matter how much time, energy, or effort you spend if you're working on a blog post or some new release for a promotion. What matters at the end of the day, did it receive enough likes? Did somebody reshare it? Was it reposted? And we can see this is transcended into education, specifically in primary school. Teachers are not rewarded on their effort. They're rewarded on the outcome of a standardized test. We're seeing that oftentimes a teacher can spend countless time, energy, and effort making sure a student progresses, but at the end of the day, if he doesn't perform on that standardized test, if outcome isn't considered then it doesn't count. It doesn't matter, it gets disregarded. And if for some reason you're thinking to yourself right now, okay, I get it, but this doesn't apply to me. The outcomes aren't there. This isn't something that I see in my everyday. Well, we all have a resume. We all allow others to judge us on face value by a list of our outcomes and our achievements. At that face value, we allow someone to determine if we're worthy enough for a second call in an internship, in a job, for a graduate school application, just on the list of our outcomes. So we think to ourselves, why not play the game? If society wants to see outcomes in a list of achievements that determines us successful because we can measure these achievements, I want to build the best resume possible. When I'm standing to the person to my right, I want to look over, look at my list of achievements, and easily say, I'm more successful. So therefore, I should be happy because my achievements outweigh those of my counterpart. So we get to college, we get into the new workplace, and we look for opportunities that can maximize our ability to achieve something. We join organizations, we join groups, we join different activities, we look for the extra opportunity at work so that we can show the amount of outcomes we achieve. But when you hand that resume over, what often happens is they don't see the full picture. They see all your outcomes and your achievements, but those last couple bullet points never get expressed. How you still feel completely lost. How from the past two to three years you've been working on these achievements, but you still have no idea what you want to do. And how many countless times you have broken down in tears at the fact that you don't have a sense of who you are because you've been too focused on the outcome. Google Maps does a great job of allowing us to place a destination, to say exactly the outcome we want, and it'll tell us most of the way of getting to this destination. It's very convenient. One of the things we miss out on, though, is that every single person in our near vicinity is getting the same exact route as we are. And this is where the disconnect happens. See, we want to achieve the outcome. We want to achieve it in the fastest, most efficient way. But not everyone is the same route. When we apply to everyday lives, we have to look back to education. Gloria Ladson Billings, she was an educator, and in 1990, she coined the term culturally relevant pedagogy. It's actually simple once we break this down. What this means is that we have students that we are trying to achieve the same outcome. But if we apply the same route or expectations to all of these students, we'll never achieve the same results because the teaching isn't culturally relevant to their background or their reality. When you apply the same route, 
the destination, it'll never connect. We all live different realities, so we have to shift our expectations to that of the student. Every single person's reality is different. Everyone's route is going to be a different path to get to the same destination. What Gloria Ladson Building states is in order to do this, we have to individually tailor our educational standards to the student. We have to look at the student's past. We have to start with what was their cultural background? What are they passionate about? What have they done in their past experiences? And we've all seen how this plays out. When you're in a classroom and it's not relevant to who you are as a person, it's hard to be engaged. It's hard to learn and take in this information because it's not relevant to you. And oftentimes, we get so fixated on an outcome that we forget of maybe that route isn't our route that we're supposed to be on. So there's a very simple equation that we have to look at now. And don't worry, I know a lot of us, when we hear the word equation, there's a slight groan that comes up thinking about math. But I'm a liberal arts major, so we're gonna keep it as simple as possible. Our happiness equals our expectation, or reality, minus expectations. So our happiness is equal to reality minus our expectations. It's very simple to see. When you plug in the directions, and you're supposed to be there on time, your expectation is But when you end up being late or rerouted, the reality is a lower value than your expectations. So at the end of the day, you're unhappy. There's a disconnect. Now, if you're supposed to be on time or late, and your reality is that you arrive early, well, everything works. Your happiness is there. You have that connection. Everything is working fine. And this is where we have to look to the Huffington Post, and this is an article written by Tim Urban. What Tim Urban states is that we as millennials have almost been done a disservice by the previous generations. Look back to our grandparents who have grown up during the Depression era. Their reality, economic security, was not great. It was not good for them at all. So when they raised our parents, they gave them the expectation of low economic security. It was something they didn't have, so they transcended that down to their children. Now our parents, growing up in the 70s, 80s, and 90s for millennials, they experienced a very decent way of life. They had greater economic security than the, what they were told by our grandparents. So their reality was greater than their expectations that they were taught to have. So they were generally happy. So what we've been taught is that we should have the highest expectations as millennials because for them, reality was better, if not match their expectations every single time. So we have such high expectations as individuals because we want to achieve an outcome that we get focused on so that we can be the best individual we can in society and at the end of the day, be happy because of the outcomes we are achieving. So we set the bar high. We set it at the top of the highest mountain we can find for ourselves and we wanna start climbing. So we start on this journey. We wanna reach the top and we wanna be there. And as we turn and as we start going, just like every journey, there's always a point where there's that accident ahead. You get rerouted, or something else happens. Now here you have the choice to continue on the journey or follow the alternate path. If you're not forced off the freeway, you continue on. You want to achieve the outcome because what we're taught in modern leadership and society is that if you want to be successful, you set your outcome and you find grit and you be resilient. And you have self-determination and willpower to achieve your overall end outcome. So you stay on your path and you keep trekking. And let's say you're one of the fortunate few who have grit, who are resilient, and can reach the top of your mountain, only to look around and realize this is the wrong mountain. We get so caught up even when we see a notification to reroute that this isn't the path for us ahead, Yet we've been taught so often to keep going no matter what because we want to be successful and reach the original destination that we planned for ourselves. Only to realize this wasn't our destination at all. So in order to get away from this, in order to break away and start getting our expectations in line with our reality so we can finally feel this connectedness and happiness, we need to completely get lost. Take your iPhone and throw it out the window because you don't need Apple Maps anymore. This might cause a little bit of fear. Why would I throw a $700 iPhone out the window? That answer is easy. You want an Android. But beyond that, <laughs> what we can see is that throwing your iPhone out the window doesn't make sense. It's unnatural. It's not something you would do. It's not something you would tell anybody to do. So when you're told not to set goals, 
when you're told to throw your five-year plan out the window, it doesn't make sense. It feels unnatural. But this is the exact step that we need to start taking. Herman Hess said it best in his book, Siddhartha. Those who seek easily find that their eyes see only the things that they seek. They can find nothing, they can take in nothing, because they always only think about the thing they are seeking. Because they have a goal, they become obsessed. Seeking means having a goal, but finding means being open, being free, and having no goal. In order to be found, we must first be lost. We need to take a step away and remove the directions in our life. We need to take the destination, unplug it, and disconnect for a moment, and look back at who we are and apply the concepts of culturally relevant pedagogy. Look at your past. Look at what you've done. Look at what you enjoyed doing as a child. Look at what you enjoy doing now. Don't have a direction and just see where you naturally go and take note of it so that you can start making your expectations in line with who you are so that your reality can finally match the expectations that you're setting for yourself. You can learn this one of two ways. For me, high school sports was important, especially growing up in Texas. And I thought I could make it to the NFL or at least get a college scholarship off of it. But my five foot eight frame and my 170 pounds might have been good for running back, except I was blessed with the speed of alignment. In this, I kept trying because that's what I was taught, to work hard. I had my first soldier surgery when I was in eighth grade. I was taught to come back and work hard and keep going. So I came back onto the field and I kept playing because I believed my end goal was to go to college off of a football scholarship. So I continued to play. One year later, I had my second surgery on my other shoulder. Came back onto the field because I don't give up. That's what I wasn't taught. I was taught to have grit. I was taught to be resilient like many of us in this room. So I kept going. My third shoulder surgery happened in my senior year. And with this one, they actually had to move bone over into my shoulder, and I will never have full mobility of it, as well as I get arthritis at 25 and another surgery at 40, just to make sure I can keep having use of my arm. You have the opportunity to actively seek being lost. Otherwise, you're forced into it. For me, I was forced. I was forced to seek other ways to get into college. I was forced to seek other hobbies and things that I have grown up with my entire life loving and not able to play anymore. So I hope that we can start actively seeking being lost. Being lost becomes an art and something that we have to engage in every single day. And when we're directionless, and when we're not looking for something, and when we're not putting on the blinders that become our five-year plans and our goals that put us on such a narrow path, we can finally start to discover who we are. Thank you.